Good morning. I'm Trudy Cox, the CEO of the Preservation Society of Newport County. And today we are inside the Newport Mansions with our guest, Mary Miley Theobald. Mary is a historian and freelance writer specializing in history, travel, and business. She received her BA and MA from the College of William and Mary, worked for Colonial Williamsburg for many years, taught American history and museum studies at Virginia Commonwealth University, and has written 15 nonfiction books, nine historical mysteries, and 200 articles for a variety of magazines and newspapers around the country. In 2012, her Roaring Twenties Murder Mysteries, the Mur Mystery, The Impersonator, won the Mystery Writers of America National Award for the best first crime novel. Congratulations to you. And I think that is a book that is available. Yes, well, might as well start with that. Um, a, a, an early Christmas present, if you want. I, If you go on to Amazon and find that book, The Impersonator by Mary Miley, um, I arranged for it to be uh, free to download the e the ebook for today and tomorrow. So it's only only those two days. Great, nice nice holiday present, Thanksgiving present. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mary has also written and lectured about the origins and history of the Christmas tree. And she joins us today to discuss that topic. And it is a complicated and very interesting story. So welcome, Mary. Um, this topic is very dear to us. We celebrate holidays at the Newport Mansions every year. Thousands of visitors come from around the world uh, to enjoy the 30 or so themed Christmas trees that decorate three of our historic houses, the Breakers, Marble House, and the Elms. It really is a treat. And it is a beautiful vision of what Christmas could have looked like during the Gilded Age, but we're well aware that these were summer cottages and they were never really occupied in the wintertime. So we've taken a lot of liberties and we hope that people just have a lot of fun and enjoy being in our houses. Um, when you look back at the evolution of the Christmas tree, the history is fascinating. For example, what was the paradise tree and why do some look at it as the forerunner to the Christmas tree? Uh, well, in the Middle Ages, uh, there was a, uh, it was not uncommon for uh, traveling itinerant players to move about putting on uh, outdoor impromptu uh, skits, as we might call them today. And when you, these were always religious, telling the stories of the Bible, and that's why the church had tolerated them. Um, the, you know, the population being almost entirely illiterate, this was the only way, aside from being in church, that they could learn about uh, the, the Bible stories. And so these were popular. And uh, one of the more popular ones was the uh, story of Adam and Eve. It's a bit of an oxymoron, but um, December 24th was celebrated in the Middle Ages as Adam and Eve's birthday. Hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Makes didn't know that <laughs> sense, very little sense but so that's the tie-in with christmas the day before christmas um and um when you're putting on a play about adam and eve obviously you're going to have a tree in the on the stage as prop and it would be hung with little apples um hmm. obviously for the story now some people say that this is the precursor to the christmas tree um, it's and that the apples are a precursor to the um, you know, little round ornament balls that we hang on the tree, which is certainly logical, but there's no documentation for it at all. And historians are always loath to say anything that doesn't come with an, a nice documented proof. And I, I do want to point out, though, that you're probably picturing apples like we have today, you know, an apple like this big. Um, apples, you know, like think of crab apples size or plum size or something. Apples were very small and they, it's, they've been bred big over the centuries. But so hanging some, a big heavy apple today is going to drag down a, a, a tree limb, a, but not then. So having little tiny apples over it could, you know, could, yeah, I can imagine that it looks sort of, sort of like a tree with little balls on it. Yeah. 
Right, that's true. Now, is it? Tell us about the first documented tree. It may have come from the German French border, but I need to hear the whole story. Yeah. Well, the the earliest documentation we have is uh, the uh, Alsatian in Alsace, that that part of France and Germany that keeps going back and forth, and is French and German at the same time. The um, uh, let's see, set it, we know. Um, the earliest, uh, let me try to find the earliest hint of a Christmas tree comes in the form of a prohibition. It was in 1561, okay, and it forbade anyone to quote have for Christmas more than one bush of more than eight shoes length. Now, eight shoes would be eight feet, eight feet tall. So, you're, what they're saying is you can't have a tree more than one taller than eight feet. Well, no one knows if this is a fire precaution, a uh, religious prohibition, a conservation measure. I mean, we probably never will know. But this in Alsace, you were for forbidden to have more than one tree, which suggests you don't pass a law unless people are having more than one tree. So, right. Yeah. So that was that's the first that we have absolute documentation. So it must have been going on before that. And that was 15... 1561. 1561. But it's a very small, it's it's not pop, it's not all throughout Germany. Germany didn't exist till 1870 when it was united. So um, it's, there, there's cer certain parts of Germany where they do this little tree business and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a minor tradition. Right, yeah. So, and, and so Christmas trees, the idea and love of Christmas trees spread. Uh, I think someone who had a huge influence in Christmas trees overall was Queen Victoria. Absolutely. And maybe you Absolutely. should tell us a little bit about the role that she played in making and popularizing yeah. the Christmas tree for the average public. Right. Well, everyone uh, knew about Queen Victoria's Christmas tree. Um, and that was when her husband, Albert, a German, um, sent back to his homeland for a, a tree, a fir tree to be sent to England and and decorated it. It was uh, a tabletop tree. And let's see, it was in, it was a six foot fir tree. It sat on a table. Each tier was uh, laden with a dozen or more lighted wax tapers. A taper is a very thin candle. Mm -hmm. An angel with outstretched arms poses at the top you know, like, like this, and then um, their golden uh, gilt, golden gingerbread uh, cookies hanging around and tiny little baskets filled with candy. And, and the base has little do dolls and soldiers and little carts and stuff around it. Um, this is 1841. Uh, and the the tradition or the or a drawing of it, since there would be no photographs, a drawing was uh, uh, made for the Illustrated London News in 1848. And then again, and Godey's Ladies Book, a real popular uh, American uh, magazine in 1850 and repeated in 1860. Um, and these drawings circulated, uh, I, I call it the Queen Victoria Media Blitz. It, this, is, this is the new, um, this is the new communications uh, device, a magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't exist before that in any recognizable form. So here we're, we're, we're popularizing something with pictures or drawings in a magazine and people all over the English speaking world are becoming aware of this, uh, something that the, the royal family is doing. And as you probably know, the British upper class always likes to imitate the royal family and the Americans like to imitate the British upper class. So <laughs> that's, it, it spread along those lines. But I, I like to point out that it wasn't the first Christmas tree in England. Queen Victoria herself as a child in 1832 remembers seeing one. Um, find my, um, yeah, 1832. She wrote in her diary as a little, the little princess wrote in her diary that her aunt Sophia had set up, quote, two trees hung with lights and sugar ornaments, all the presents being placed around the tree. Mm. So mm. 
there it was. And before that, 1789, way before that, Queen Charlotte, who's the wife of George III, which I like to call him the last king of America, um, she sent back to her native uh, German province, uh, Mecklenburg Strelitz, in northern Germany, and she ordered a Christmas tree to be sent to England. I guess they didn't have what she had in mind growing in England because they're always shipping them from Germany. <laughs> and her the Queen's physician, um, Dr. John Watkins, wrote in his journal. He said it was a charming imported German custom with bunches mm. of sweetmeats, almonds, and raisins in papers, fruits and toys most tastefully arranged on its branches. Ah. So, so they were there. I mean, it was a German, little German custom that the royal family had enjoyed, but why, uh, why wasn't it known? Did it spread then? No, because there were no magazines to the, the or well, there probably were some precursors to magazines but magazines hadn't come into their own and people hadn't people didn't have the chance to learn about the tree that they did when queen victoria and albert had their tree for their children so the magazines created the rage for i think yeah i think we can definitely christmas trees that. right yeah. and and what was the custom how long was a tree does it say in any of these documents how long a tree was put up and when was it taken down and and more importantly, I, I'm asking two questions, actually. Uh, the idea of having tapers or candles on a tree is pretty terrifying. <laughs> so, so we have to hear you talk about both things. How long was a tree put up for? And also, what about the safety issues? Okay, let's do tapers first. Um, yeah. Yeah, the one thing that is common on all Christmas trees is the lights of some some sort. Tapers were the first idea to use, a little tiny, or a candle stub when it was only maybe this big. You run a wire through it and you wire it to the branch. And you, you touch the wick with a little bit of oil so it catches quickly and it flames. Um, and you stand there with a bucket of water, I guess. I don't know. It scares me to death. Um, there have been horrible Christmas tree fires that are very deadly. Um, a tree doesn't burn. It explodes. It, it, the dryness and the resin in it just poof, it goes up like that. And it's frightening. So I, I can't, you know, I, I, I just get nervous thinking about it. Um, but they also not just didn't use only tapers, but um, some imaginative people would get half an eggshell or half a walnut shell, put oil in it and a little tiny wick and make oil lamps to put on your tree. Or I read one New York Christmas tree had 200 gas jets lighting it. That doesn't cause a heart attack. I don't know what would. Uh, until the 1870s, 80s, 90s, when Edison's miraculous new uh, uh, lights came into play. And I can go into that no I'll go into that now what the heck um <laughs> the the lights that Edison I there's some interesting information on that um there obviously it was a safety measure and and people you know were interested in it for that um the the big break came in okay 1879 when Edison invented a light bulb, and it was only a couple of years later that one of his uh, employees, a vice president, I think, of the Edison, Edward Johnson, um, he invented, actually, he put together some strings of little smaller lights. And interestingly, we, we think Christmas colors are sort of red and green, you know, and that's not what the first Christmas lights were, red, white, and blue. They were patriotic oh. colors. So that was their, their idea. Uh, the Johnson's house on Fifth Avenue was the first with a lighted, a tree lighted with Edison uh, bulbs, and it just stunned people. He not only had a tree that lit, he put a little motor on it so it rotated, and the lights wow. were off, you know, red, blue, white, like that. And people were, people were, you know, amazing. One visitor wrote, it was brilliantly lighted with many colored globes about as large as an English walnut and was turning some six times a minute on a little pine box. There were 80 lights in all encased in these dainty glass eggs and about equally divided between white, red, and blue. As the tree turned, the colors alternated 
all the lamps going out and being relit at every revolution. The rest was a continuous twinkling of dancing colors, red, white, blue, white, red, blue, all evening. So that's, but the, um, by the 1890s, and you're getting into, you know, the, the Gilded Age, of course, this was all the rage. It's not only safer, it's more, it's uh, prettier and it's, um, it's fashionable, but only the very wealthy people could have afforded right. them. Um, yeah. They were hugely expensive. Uh, there's an advertisement I found in Scientific American. Uh, also, you had to kind of make them yourself. I mean, you had to kind of wire the house yourself for electricity. Um, but the Scientific American ad says, no danger from the lights on Christmas trees when Edison miniature lamps are used. The lamps can be either bought or rented at low cost. Well, that's wow. a lie. That's a bald-faced lie because the, the truth is it's very expensive. And not only that, the electricity to light them was very expensive. And you're right. not likely to be uh, uh, wired for electricity unless you were rich. There's a 1903 ad that had one string of lights was $12. That's an average man's week's wages. And I, mm. um, and, and I played with the little, uh, what do you call it, inflation? Um, mm -hmm. Get to, to get what that that would be four hundred and nineteen dollars today for one string one <laughs> string um and then the price is falling of course but there's one for three dollars in um a few years later um but it only has eight lights on it I mean, so you need a lot of strings you know and sears sears finally offered them in 1907 for four dollars and 67 cents but that's still 152 dollars so yeah, right. it came down, but you know, this is for only for the very, very rich. Um, and the, oh, the ads also say, I think this is the funny part. Anyone can readily wire and put up the lamps if there is electric current in the house. Right. Well, you it's just do it yourself. I couldn't. <laughs> no, and you know, Mary, too, that there was a lot of controversy about electricity. Many people were very scared of it. Well, that's true. At the very beginning, they were afraid to turn that switch. And if they turned the switch, maybe the whole house would go in flames. So there was a whole transition that yeah. needed to, the public needed to go yeah. through yeah, this is uh, regarding Edison's great invention. And it was perhaps one of the greatest innovations of the oh, Gilded really? Age, but it didn't happen overnight. So now do you put electric lights on your trees? I yes, we do. Know. Yes, yeah. we do. Yeah. Are they historically, like, did you try to get kinds that look like they're? No, they're we haven't. Uh, you know, in our case, and anybody who's from Newport knows this story, our houses were summer cottages. Very unusual, maybe doubtful that anybody, whether they were Vanderbilts or Berwins or any of the summer residents were even here during Christmas. So we take a lot of liberties. We yeah. are decorating purely from imagination yeah, and well, for fine. fun and for fantasy. Um, I, there are some tourists who come and reject and um, object to the fact that it's not historic and not traditional. You know, you know how much uh, we, we decorate more than 30 trees in all three houses. One of them is a poinsettia tree that I think is maybe 40 feet high. Uh, it, yeah. So, but um ours is pure fantasy and we try to let the public know that you know when you're visiting the breakers everything but the decorations is real <laughs> well you know you might if you haven't already try try to do one tabletop tree uh sort of or or floor length they were both um and try to decorate it with uh red white and blue i love it you no know, and just to say this is this is more like uh, like Edison, like Mr. Johnson's tree. There's a picture, an actual photograph of that tree. It looks pathetic. It looks this little uh, Charlie Brown uh, Christmas tree and some lights on it on a box, and it's going. Uh, uh, but <laughs> it's not much, I can tell you. Yeah. Oh, no, I think that's a very good suggestion, and I'm definitely going to pass that on to our staff. Thank you. Um, and then getting back to what was the lifespan of a tree in a, a person's house, if you know? Right. Uh, well, we, we can't know, but um, the the whole concept of the tree was different, and it changed over time uh, from the Victorian era 
from Queen Victoria's tree. And most people at that time came up in America, came across a Christmas tree at their Sunday school, not at home. And then maybe they brought the idea at home. It was an event, an activity, I like to say. The Christmas tree was not something that you put up a static display and then admired for the next few weeks or months. Um, it was an event, you put the tree up, you wired it for uh, with tapers or, or lights, and you hung candies, cookies, and toys. We have descriptions of trees that are you know, phenomenal. Um, and then you would open it up, maybe put a curtain around it or, or open the doors and let all the children come in with the, a big party was a, a good way to have a Christmas tree. So that everybody would come in, and somebody of authority, usually the father, would they'd light the tree and everybody would ooh and ah. And then the father would take off the ornaments one by one. And mm -hmm. sometimes the ornaments would be maybe have a little uh, label saying this one was for Kathy and this one was for Ben. And, um, and sometimes there were little poems or something you'd read about somebody or for someone. And, or, you'd, or it was little cornucopias with candy in them or something. And you'd hand them to the father would hand them out to the children. Either he would decide where they went or um, they were named, there were names on them. So after all the candies and toys are handed out from the tree and the fires put out, uh, the tree would be taken away. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not pretty anymore and it's nothing but a fire hazard at this point. So the tree would be taken out. That's a big difference from what we do today when people, I'm sure at Thanksgiving, people are decorating their trees and they're gonna have them up for two months, all of December and all of January. And they that's why we had to go to artificial trees um, because a live tree isn't gonna make it. Uh, right, yeah. That, that long. Um, and you know, the, the tree is static, it's to admire and then everything's taken off and we, when I was little, we did have uh, candy and we had little uh, cornucopias and little baskets on the tree with M&Ms or something in them. And um, I don't see that much anymore. I, I, I've done that with my own, but um, that's, I guess that's a holdover. And a lot of our ornaments today are reminiscent of the toys. They're little, maybe you have a little ornament that's a rocking horse or a little ornament that's a little doll or something. And that's because of those toys, small toys that were on the tree. This is so interesting. I understand it now better. I've always wondered about how and why there were candles. So the truth is that they were really only up for, the tree was decorated for a night with candles with a lot of people around watching. Right. So that if there was any kind of incident, fire incident, somebody could go into action. So you weren't leaving candle lit trees up for day and night oh gosh <laughs> for weeks and weeks and weeks with somebody somehow checking in periodically I, I get it now that's very interesting to me yeah. now that was the victorian tradition or yes. or was it something that was happening even before queen victoria or do we not know we don't have any well the, the earlier one that um i just read about with at queen charlotte and uh George III had the tree, and I'm sure that was the same way. I mean, it doesn't make sense. You, you can't have a tree lit unless there are a lot of people around. I mean, it must have been at a party. Whether there were children involved, I don't know. Could have been little, little uh, gifts for adults too. Little trinkets. Could have been little bits of jewelry. That was also done. A little, you know, rings and baubles and such. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the change I think comes as, as uh, the electric lights allow you to make it a safety issue. It's, it's no longer something that has to be used once and, and, and dismantled. So mm -hmm. you can start to see when people can afford um, electric lights, which doesn't happen until the 20th century, um, then you start to see trees staying up longer. I see, and then uh, when, so this really was for the, the elite, the people who could afford. The beginning. Yeah. And, and so when did trees, so it it, it was partly electrical. I, I gather, when, when did trees really become something that every family had in their house? Well, Christmas I, trees. Yeah, I don't know that you can even say that today because of course we have so many Americans with different religious uh, traditions, but um, 
I know growing up, we, we, uh, I had Jewish friends who had Christmas trees up. Who uh, they, It was just a holiday tree. And they it yeah. was no, re- the Christmas tree doesn't have to have religious uh, uh, um, links to it. it, it it's just decoration. So it can be a secular, uh, anybody can have a Christmas tree, no matter what your religious yeah. beliefs. Um, but when did it become really, con- I, I think probably, I haven't really thought about that, probably not until more like the 1910s and 20s. I think we would have seen more of it. Um, the uh, Christmas trees, real live trees were cut and sold at marketplaces and I've noticed from prints, uh, in, interesting showing, it's interesting to me that the prints showing these markets with people buying Christmas trees, the, the lady of the house is usually buying the tree and she's dressed up pretty nice, a beautiful hat and nice clothes. She's a, she's a well-to-do person. And then you can see people around. Uh, it's usually African-Americans who have gone into the woods or the nearby out, you know, city, outside the city limits and brought in greenery or trees. Uh, who are selling them uh, out of a cart, maybe, or something like that at a market. Mm, mm. So that, that's a, I, th- these traditions change slowly. Uh, it's hard to say. Right. I think where you have more German immigrants, which would tend to be uh, the Northern um, colonies or states and middle, middle West, I think it probably happened faster. Right, yeah. Um, trees back then too were tabletop trees. When did we go from putting a tree on top of a table to having a full length tree in the corner of our living yeah. room? <laughs> um, there again, I think that's that's just really gradual. Uh, well, Queen Victoria's tabletop tree was still six feet tall. Wow. And she, well, she had a palace with tall yeah. ceilings. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know, it's, it, it, I guess it's what you could uh, what you could buy or cut yourself you lived on a farm as most people were farmers uh, until even in the 1920s, 60% of Americans were farmers. Um, you just go out to your woods nearby and cut something, um, yeah. or whatever size you cut, uh, you, you could, you could bring home and, and put up. Um, if you're buying one from the, for the city folks, they can't do that. And they might buy something. To, I guess it just depended on your house and how much room you had. Right. Yeah. Um, and and the base of the tree, that's always the thing that we have arguments about in our household uh, and getting it straight. What kind of base was used for a six foot on top of a table in Queen Victoria's palace? <laughs> I have, here's, here's the only description I have. Uh, this is a Civil War era, um, it's 1860s, so it's early for Christmas trees. And they say, here's, this is a description in a magazine on how to dress your Christmas tree. Um, and it says, uh, put green baize fabric tacked down on to cover the floor. So you pound fabric into your wooden floor and then place a large ceramic jar in the middle and you put the tree in that with wet sand and then cover it all with green chintz to conceal the jar. Hmm. I don't for a minute believe that sticking a tree trunk <laughs> into wet sand in a jar is going to keep it from tipping over. I think this is ridiculous. <laughs> but this is what they're saying. Um, and then they say to light it with, you know, long strings of bright red holly berries threaded like beads upon fine cord festooned with graceful garlands from the boughs of the tree, bouquets of paper flowers, tiny flags of gay ribbons, stars and shields of gilt paper, lace bags filled with colored candies, knots of bright ribbon. Um, And they put several dolls on the tree for the girls and for the boy, a large cart with two horses, can't have been too large. Uh, The cart of the horses drove gaily among the top branches as if each steed possessed the wings of Pegasus and wooden animals romped on the moss. At the very top, a gilded, empty birdcage awaited the canary that was to be one child's gift. They put an empty empty birdcage, and you're going to get a pet canary. 
Oh, my Lord, isn't that a great story and great description? And some of those traditions, like the string of, of berries, is still very common today. We do and big bows that we use in our trees that make it more festive. We've stolen some of the ideas from the 1850s oh, yeah. to 60s. Yeah. Uh, I don't find popcorn um, until the 20th century. Nobody really made popcorn. Then that uh -huh. was popular uh, make at home kind of right. well, all the decorations were made at home until uh, the Germans started making nice um, blown glass, you know, those the, the very fragile blown glass ornaments. And they were some of them were shipped over here in like the 1870s. And of course, you see an idea and you make it yourself. So there are American companies starting to make them. Um, and F.W. Woolworth imported them in the 1880s. And that's when, if you have really old uh, German ornaments at home, they are yeah. not older than the 1880s. They, that's that's the oldest they can be. Um, I've got some from my grandparents that are more like 1920s that I treasure because they're just very different. But they, and every year, one of them breaks. Or so right. <laughs> and, and they're very, very thin. Paper, almost, yeah. really, almost... You, you don't even want to touch them because they're yeah. so thin and you know, I've got something special here. Yeah. Well, and they had to be very light because you were dealing with a real tree and the branches would sag if you put anything heavy on them. Today with 50% of people I've read use uh, a fake tree. Well, those branches are stiff and they can hold a heavy ornament. Sometimes when I'm looking at ornaments in the stores, I think, this is way too heavy. I can yeah. possibly hang this, but I use a real tree. Right. So ornaments can be heavier now that half the population is using uh, stiffer, stiffer tree branches. So in 1856, President Pierce oh, yes. had the first Christmas tree in the White House. This might be the most notable thing that President Pierce ever did. I, really? Yeah, what do we re remember? And tell us about his Christmas tree. That's pretty dramatic for the president to introduce a tree into the White House. He called it a German tree, that, that's telling. And um, the, the place you bought trees in those days was the Washington DC Central Market. That doesn't exist anymore. Eastern Market is still there in Washington, but not Central Market. That was where you bought trees and they came by the wagon load from uh, Maryland or Virginia. Uh, nearby, of course. So we know the first tree at the White House was from America. Nowadays, they take a tree from out west and because they, they want a really, really big, tall one. I'm sure in 1856, this was a tabletop tree. No, it doesn't say that, but I, yeah, I'm sure that's what it was. You mean um, in, in the White House? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it had to have been. And then, um, let's see, after that, I have something else describing the Benjamin Harrison, that's right, had, um, again, what do you remember him for? Um, he, he had, um, when he was president, he wrote in 1893, right in the midst of your period, mm -hmm. he um, had uh, a, a, a tree in the White House. And by then, they, someone, some clever person had invented Christmas hooks, uh, ornament hooks, mm. uh, yeah, patented in 1892. So uh, you, before that, you had to tie with string or wire every ornament onto a branch, which is a bit tedious, and then getting them off again. But um, with ornament hooks, it's been, that's, that was a good invention. <laughs> yes, very. Um, and President Harrison wrote, um, when, when he was talking about his tree, he said, I am an ardent believer in the duty we owe ourselves as Christmas to make merry to children at Christmas time. And we shall have an old fashioned Christmas tree for my grandchildren upstairs, not public, but upstairs in the family. And I shall be their Santa Claus myself. If my influence does for aught in this busy world, let me hope that my example may be followed in every family in the land. So he's being Santa Claus. He means he's going to take the ornaments off the tree and hand them out. Right. Yeah. That is, that's his uh, duty. But when you notice he uses the word old fashioned Christmas, and this is when Christmas is no more than 50 years. It's been in, in America more than 50 years. So how old fashioned, I guess that's two generations. I mean, that's, yeah. that's something, but. Uh, 
Did that get a lot of press? I, I wonder if that yeah. generated a lot of um, sure. oh, people imagining trees in their own house and how much they would like to do it. I, do you think that that catapulted the idea of I, yeah. families having trees in their houses? Absolutely. I think that made a big difference. And, and as I said, it was a gradual it was a gradual thing, but it was new enough in the, with Pierce, uh, President Pierce, that it was probably uh, an eye opener for a lot of people. But by the time Benjamin Harrison was president, it was just, oh, good. They're having one at the White House. Maybe we should have one this year. You know, right. And imagine today Christmas in the White House is a spectacular Right. A production where people are brought in, the best decorators in the world are brought in and they work at it starting in, I guess, early October. And yeah. I don't know. It's well, sure. Most historic house museums decorate for Christmas. I mean, they, and they some do it in a, uh, a period fashion and some like you just do it for, for um, enjoyment. And, yeah, yeah. Um, but but I, I think you will not find a historic house in America that isn't decorated for Christmas. That's true. And we, we do, we give nods. For example, you might go into Mr. Vanderbilt's bedroom and the, the uh, ornaments will be trains because that was how he made his money. Oh, I see. So, and maybe a top hat. Uh, we, we try to pick up on a theme yeah. of the family and, but we also are having a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, it's a nice, it, 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 you have to use fake trees for fire. Reason. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, that's a requirement yeah. of Rhode Island fire yeah. laws. Yeah, we cannot all, use real. Yeah, and and in, in, in all historic places, that's a requirement that you yeah. have to. Um. So tell us a little bit about the um unbelievable statistic going back to 1909. You know what? Of the U.S. At... Forest Service cutting down, the, estimating that five million trees were being cut down. Yeah. Uh, for Christmas. That's my notes say that was half the number of families in the country at the time. Well, and that's, you know, I thought about that. And I, that, that just didn't say, I think that's a mistake. Um, Cause I looked at the population. It was 90 million in 1909, roughly. And um, 5 million tree, the average household was not 18 people. So, but not that many people were buying trees. They were they were cutting yeah. their own, and the right. Forest Service would not be aware of the fact if you went into your little woods next to your farm and cut a tree. So I think the the figure is probably true that about half the ha families were uh, had a Christmas tree of some kind, but I don't think it was. It implies that all the uh, five million was was uh, giving everybody the tree. Uh, the trees weren't coming from the Forest Service land, just five million of them. And that would have taken five million households. But if you figure what, four or five people per household, you know, that's, I don't know. I, I think the figure is probably right that half the households were having trees. Right, yeah. But not from the Forest Service. Right. I wonder when we lost the tradition of having uh, food ornaments on trees. I don't think that's done anymore. It, well, maybe it is done, but well, not done in my household. We still have, we, well, we still have uh, little uh, uh, cornucopias, a little like uh, conical things that you put on and you put M&Ms or something in them. Um, and yeah, and I think maybe, maybe it's just... Uh, you know, cookies get, st you make nice little cookies and they get stale on the tree or again, yeah. it's, the tree is permanent. It is, is up for a month or two months. You know, it's yeah. not a, it, it's well, that's a, a good point. I keep forgetting that trees were started as an event, not yeah. a, yeah. not a long standing several week. Yeah. I saw some uh, uh, indication that they were, somebody was hanging tiny miniature pies I mean, a little tiny pie on the tree. That was sounded weird, but um, so you take off the little pie and eat it like maybe. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Were yeah. Hanging them on the tree for probably one day. Right. Yeah. And then um, Woolworths had a very big impact uh, on the growth of interest in trees by popularizing ornaments. 
Yeah, they we, did. Um, they they were first importing them from Germany in the 1880s, but then that's expensive. And what, as soon as American companies started making ornaments, Woolworths would have gotten them from from America. So, you know, if you've if you've got the old ones, uh, they're probably American made. But yeah. unless you have family uh, coming from Germany or service people, servicemen and women serving in Germany at Christmas would always bring home German nutcrackers and German, you know, Christmas, uh, right. Christmas items. I now understand better, given the history of trees dating back to Germany, why Christmas fairs in Germany are such a popular destination. Yeah. And every German town has a big marketplace at Christmas time with glue That's vine and yeah. yeah. So it and really, yeah. yeah, they're just reflecting their history mm -hmm. that, that Christmas is theirs and, and it spread to all the rest of us, but it really got started. Uh, well, we think it, it documented started there. Yeah. Some places say, Oh, it was Poland. It was, it was, you know, this, you know, they all have a, want to claim early Christmas, early trees. And, and they're, you know, that's fine. It, it, right. But, but it was, it, it was uh, certainly, certainly around in the 1500s. You can say right. that but it didn't Christmas trees. Christmas did not go back as far as the Roman empire. That's, yeah. that's Saturnalia. That's a different holiday. That's, that's not, yeah, that's not Christmas. You can't mix those two up. Well, we have about a minute left, and I would like to ask you, um, you know, your other life is as a mystery writer. So <laughs> do you want to tell us a little bit about that side of you, Mary? Well, I, I'm a historian, and my specialty was always colonial America, I'm working for Colonial Williamsburg for decades, and um, and enjoyed that very much. But uh, somehow, the 1920s just intrigues me as being the most interesting decade in American history. I just think it's fabulously, it's it's when modern America began. It's, you know, it's when the women's, women actually started to become more equal. The fashions, wooden clothing or, um, you know, music, the beginning of jazz, the, begin, the, the introduction of all kinds of household goods from toasters to hot water to um, refrigerators and vacuum cleaners to women working in jobs to women going to college. I mean, it, it, it's just, then you get to vaudeville and silent movies, which I think are fascinating. Um, and radio, early radio. I, I, I'm just in love with the era. And so- We'll have to all go out and buy your, the, it's the Roaring Twenties Murder Mystery, The Impersonator, Impersonator yeah. which is now available as a benefit for the next two days on Amazon. Mary is making it available for free. And uh, maybe we will see a, a influx of people oh, reading your it. materials, Mary. I, I think this has just been a fast, what a way to start out uh, the Christmas season with your great knowledge of Christmas and where the Christmas tree comes from and all of the traditions. I really thank you so much for being with us today. This is great. And keep up your great work. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure.